So our, our text today will be Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. So another Christmas season is upon us. Um, I think it, we'd all agree that it's easy to get caught up with all the, the hustle and bustle and activities and all the stuff that accompanies this time of year. And it's easy to just to fail to stop and think what this is all about. You might drive by the nativity scene in, in town and it just makes you think, well, you know, Christmas is, is approaching. Time to get the, you know, the presents delivered and all this stuff. Um, but we need to stop and ask ourselves, really, why? Why did this happen? Why did God become a man? What was accomplished by this uh, incarnation, him becoming a man? And, and many would rightfully tell you that he, Jesus came so that he could die on the cross for our sins uh, so that we can go to heaven, right, have eternal life, which is, of course, true. Um, and I think it's easy to think about the reason Jesus came um, and died as something that is only so, that only affects us in the future, right? After we leave this world, that the Son of God became man, died, rose again, so we can have eternal life in heaven. And so the the, the real rewards are really later. And what we get here from uh, in this life from that is really inconsequential. So we just kind of live these. Um, ascetic, miserable lifestyles as Christians, and we follow all these strict rules and have no fun. But hey, it's worth it because we get to go to heaven when we die. And that's just not true. Uh, yes, our greatest reward will be to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus. But it is wrong and unbiblical to think that salvation in Christ has no actual effect or anything positive really on our everyday lives here and now. And this morning, I want to look at a passage of Scripture that demonstrates, I think, that salvation in Christ has blessings not only in the life to come eternally, but in the life, in this life here and now. So I want to look at verses uh, 14 to 18 of Hebrews 2. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit and, and start reading verse 10 just to give us a little bit of, of context. So let's begin reading in uh, Hebrews 2, verse 10. To 18. For it was fitting that he, that's Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham." Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So this chapter in Hebrews is talking primarily about the incarnation of Christ, the very purpose of, or what's supposed to be the purpose of the Christmas holiday. The, the author of Hebrews states in verse 7 that Christ was made a little lower than the angels. Right? He, he, he became a man. He put aside his spiritual nature and took on physical human flesh. Uh, the Son of God, for whom and by whom all things exist, became a man. Why? Uh, he says in verse 14, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, right? He himself took on flesh and blood. Uh, so what does that mean? Who are the, who are the children? If you look at the end of verse 13, um, the author of Hebrews, and we don't know who it is, which is 
why it's kind of annoying to keep saying the author of Hebrews instead of Paul, though it's probably Paul. Um, he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, Behold, I and the children God has given me. That's from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. In that passage, the prophet Isaiah writes about how he and his actual children uh, were signs of God's faithfulness. And in a similar way, Jesus, who's greater than the prophets, has his own children given to him from the Father. Not physical uh, children, like the Da Vinci Code, right? Um, Jesus mentions this in the high priestly prayer, uh, prayer of John 17. He says, I manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So the people that the Father has given to the Son as a gift are his children. Those are the ones for whom Christ died. Uh, the children of God are those who Christ has saved by his grace. And since those children share in flesh and blood, right, we're made up of physical you know, molecules and cells, Jesus became that. He became flesh and blood and partook of the same things that they did. So Jesus experienced pain, hunger, sorrow, trials, tribulations, all of that. He knew what it was like to be lonely. He knew what it was like to be tempted. And most of all, he experienced what we will all experience, and that is death. He went through everything we go through, except he did it without sinning, not even for uh, one millisecond. Uh, so we are flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood, and he died. And for what? It says that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, how can the devil have the power of death? I think the devil is given way too much credit and way too much power attributed to him. Um, and many Christians are just downright superstitious and thinking everything bad comes from the devil, which is unbiblical. So is the devil like the grim reaper just waiting to pounce on anybody and to kill them? Is he going around killing everybody? Anyone who dies, oh, the devil got him? No, the biblical answer is no. Right? God is the author of life and death. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, right? Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. So God gives life, God takes life. So this has to mean something other than the devil just has this authority to take everyone's life at whim. Satan having the power of death does not mean he has the power over the physical act of dying. Right? This has to do with a, uh, this has a spiritual side to it. This is a spiritual type of death. Satan has um, this power of spiritual death that he keeps people enslaved to. Uh, the New Testament has many passages that use this kind of language. So for example, Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Is that literal? No, it's physical. We are phys uh, spiritual, rather. Spiritually dead, right? So without Christ, we're spiritually dead, unable to save ourselves. We're enslaved to sin. We're in darkness. So Death, darkness, slavery are all words used to describe the soul of all people who are outside of Christ. So if you are a Christian now, that means at one time you were dead in your sin. You were enslaved. You were in darkness. And becoming a Christian means you're no longer spiritually dead, but you are alive. You are a new creature. You've been given new life. You're, you're no longer enslaved. You're set free. You're no longer in darkness. You've uh, come to the light. Colossians 1, 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So the domain of darkness is Satan's domain. That's the power of death. So if you're in the domain of darkness, you're under Satan's power of death. Acts 26, 18 says that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. You see that the forgiveness of sins is the thing that delivers us from the darkness. So you'll see throughout the Bible that it uses very black and white terminology when it comes to the state of a person's soul. So every single one of us here is either in darkness or in light. You're either in the darkness under the power of death, under the power of Satan, or you're in the light and liberty of Christ. There's no in between. So naturally, we're all under that. We're all under Satan's domain. We're all under darkness. 
and death, and we cannot escape. We can't get ourselves out. And if we're honest, naturally, we don't want to escape. We like it that way. We think everything is just fine. I'm living my life. I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts. Meanwhile, you're oblivious to the fact that you're enslaved to sin and Satan, and you love it until the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin and makes you aware that you are in slavery. Or to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, you're perfectly content making mud pies in the slum because you cannot imagine what it's like to have a holiday by the sea. So all people by default are under the power of death, under the devil. But one of the reasons why Christ came, and hopefully one of the reasons why we celebrate Christmas, was the fact that he came to destroy Satan's power, and he did this through his death. So the power of death, which the devil possesses, is defeated through death, the death of Christ. Uh, So that word destroy means to render powerless. In other uh, verses, it's translated as to bring to naught, right? To bring to nothing. So it's not that Satan's power of death ceases to exist. It's that for the believer, Satan is powerless. He's rendered powerless. He has no authority over the believer in Christ. Through the death of Christ, Satan has been disarmed and therefore his children are delivered. The the power that death, uh, the power of that death that uh, he has is now useless against the child of God through the death of Christ. But how? How does that practically work out? How can the death of Christ free us from this death? And the answer is that the death of Christ provides us the means by which our sins are paid for and forgiven, which reconciles us to the Father. So there's other verses in Acts and Colossians I mentioned. At the end, they talk about the forgiveness of sins. That's where the, the, the release is found. Our sin has separated us from God, Our sin has kept us under the domain of death, under the domain of the devil, preventing us from having fellowship with a holy God. And in order for sinful man to be reconciled to a holy God, that debt of sin has to be paid, right? Justice has to be served for our sins against God. And he can't just let people go, right? He has to enforce justice. And so the Son of God took on flesh, became a man, lived a perfect sinless life, right? The life you and I could never live. And then he died in the place of sinners as if he were the worst, most vilest sinner to ever walk the earth. And on that tree, the wrath of Almighty God was poured out on the Son for the sins of his children that he spoke of. And he drank God's wrath down to the last drop and through his death, payment of sin was completed, and that's why he cried out, it is finished, to telestai, was actually an accounting term, finished, paid in full, the debt was paid, and then three days later, he rose from the dead, defeating death itself, that one thing no one could ever defeat, and proved his sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. And so this forgiveness of sin, which reconciles us to God, is made effectual in our lives, personally, through faith in Christ alone. So turning from sin, trusting in his finished work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Uh, So when a person, by God's grace, repents and turns from their sin, puts their trust in Jesus alone, they are made right with God. They are justified uh, before God by faith alone. And when that happens to a person, they are delivered from the domain of death, from darkness, from Satan, through the forgiveness of sins through the death of Christ. That's how the death of Christ destroys or disarms the one, the devil, who has uh, power over death. And there's something more. The devil disarmed and we are delivered. We're delivered from what? Let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So what that tells us is apart from Christ, all people are enslaved to the fear of death. Enslaved to the fear of death. Now, you, you have people who may not be Christian, they may not be right with God, who will tell you boldly they're not afraid to die. They'll come up with all kinds of reasons to convince themselves that they have nothing to worry about when that inevitable day comes upon them. 
They may convince themselves that they are a good person, that they are moral enough to go to heaven because they've developed their own standard of morality and goodness. Or maybe they'll say they lived a very sincere religious life or overall they're just a good person. So if there is a heaven, they'll go there. Or perhaps they've convinced themselves there's no God at all or we just can't know. So we just cease to exist after after we die. And on those grounds, or maybe some others, they will say, I do not fear death. <clears throat> but I find it very hard to believe that a person who has no assurance of sins forgiven will die completely at peace, at least in any deep and meaningful way. Because there's always going to be that thought nagging you. What if I was wrong? What if what the preacher told me was true? What if I'm not good enough? What if I wasn't religious enough? What if there is a God, and what if the God of the Bible is true, that's going to inevitably, inevitably be upon their minds on their deathbed, if they're given a deathbed, and there's no way around that. Going through life and going through death, with that always in the back of your mind, is slavery. If you do not know Christ, you are enslaved to the fear of death. You may not fear the process of dying, because you're tough, you're not afraid of the pain. But if you're truly honest, you fear death itself. You don't know what's coming. You're not confident you're going to be okay afterwards because it's a big question mark in your mind. And you know in your conscience that, that God has given you that you have sinned against God in more ways than you could possibly imagine and the God that you know exists has revealed himself through the beauty and majesty of creation and through his holy word, you know he's a holy and just God and he can't just let sinners go unpunished, that there has to be accountability. And that's constantly on your mind, probably pushed to the back of your mind so it doesn't bother you too much. So if you don't have Christ, you don't have forgiveness of sins and you're therefore enslaved to the fear of death. Death is your worst enemy and you know it. You can try to suppress the fear all you want. You can try to normalize the chains that are fastened so tightly around you. You can convince yourself that this slavery is normal, but that doesn't mean you're not enslaved. You are. The believer in Jesus Christ has no fear of this thing called death. They are set free of that. Yes, the believer may be weak at times and waver, but then we must look to the scriptures and remind ourselves how Christ has freed us from the fear of judgment, the fear of death through his own death. The Christian is free from slavery of the fear of death. The unbeliever is not. The person who is not following the Lord Jesus Christ is enslaved to fear. And it says lifelong, right? Your whole life. From the moment you realize there is this thing called death, you are afraid of it. I want to read you a couple of quotes, documented historical quotes from people who died, some who died under the slavery of the fear of death, and some who died free from the fear of death found only in Jesus Christ. First, let me give you a couple who died under the slavery of the fear of death. It's very evident. Voltaire, the 18th century French philosopher who hated Christ, hated Christianity and boasted that within 20 years he would destroy all of Christianity with his own hand. He said this at his death, on his deathbed. I am abandoned by God and man, I will give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months' life. Then I shall go to hell and you will go with me. O Christ, O Jesus Christ. Edward Gibbon, English historian, author of uh, the multi-volume work decline, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, said this, This day may be my last. I will agree that immortality of the soul is at times a very comfortable doctrine. All this is now lost, finally, irrevocably lost. All is dark and doubtful. And there are dozens and dozens more of quotes like this. I could probably read them off for another hour. The time does not permit us to do so. Now, some believers who died free from the fear of death. Notice the contrast here. John Bunyan, <clears throat> author of The Pilgrim's Progress, Puritan who suffered immensely for the gospel, said, Weep not for me on his deathbed. Weep not for me, 
but for yourselves. I go to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will no doubt, notice he said, no doubt, through the mediation of his blessed Son, receive me, though a sinner, when I hope we shall ere long meet to sing the new song and remain everlastingly happy, a world without end. Amen. Amen. Richard Baxter, the Puritan preacher, I am the vilest dunghill worm that ever went to heaven. Lord, what is man? What am I, vile worm to the great God? And the last word he said to those who were around his deathbed was, the Lord teach you to die. David Brainerd, missionary to the American Indians who suffered immensely, died at the age of 29. He was said to have whispered on his deathbed, he will come and will not tarry as shall soon be in glory, soon be with God and his angels. Amen. Notice those men did not say, I am, I am a good person, I know I'll get... No, they said, I'm the vilest of sinners, and they were trusting in Jesus alone. So in those few quotes I read, you can see a very stark difference between those who come to the end of their life in the midst of their slavery compared to those who have been set free from the fear of death. And according to our text this morning, Jesus came to deliver us from the bondage of that particular slavery. And that is one of the many, many blessings of salvation that is given to the child of God for this life, not just in the next. We are free from that fear here and now. Can you honestly say before God, you are free from that fear of death? Amen. We can rejoice that the devil has been disarmed, the power of death Um, uh, has been taken from him. We've been delivered from slavery to this fear of death. That that deliverance has a very practical and profound impact on your everyday life. You may not even realize it, but you'll be filled with joy. You'll be filled with hope and thanksgiving and gratitude. You'll look at life in a whole new perspective when you come to Christ and you're free from that fear of death because nothing else and no one else can free you from that besides him because he died to defeat death and rose again. When you're in Christ, what happens is you have a completely new outlook upon this thing called death. Matthew Henry, the commentator, I love what he said about this. He said, Christ became man and died to deliver them from perplexities of soul by letting them know that death is not only a conquered enemy, but a reconciled friend. Death is, now, is not now in the hand of Satan, but in the hand of Christ. I think that sums up the difference quite well. Death, which used to be your enemy, is now your reconciled friend. You don't fear it anymore. Why? Because you have assurance of the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ and his death. You have assurance because Christ defeated death. Christ defeated your enemy, and you no longer fear him. A couple of my boys started training in jiu-jitsu, so watch out. You don't mess with them. You may find yourself on the ground in a chokehold. Maybe not yet. They just started. But, but the instructor was telling the class, because I sit in on it, um, and he was telling them how they need to look their opponent in the face. Look them in the face, even if they're huge, right? Don't show fear, because they prey on that, right? Um, look them in the face. Look them in the eyes with confidence. So if you want to be victorious over your opponent, you can't be timid and fearful. You have to be bold and confident. And apart from Christ, your greatest opponent is death. Can you look your opponent confidently in the face and say, I don't fear you. I don't fear death. Really and truly. Do you have what it takes to defeat death? What do you have to defeat death? Ask yourself that. Without Christ, you have nothing. You have nothing to defeat death. What do you possess that can get you out of the eternal death that awaits you after your physical death if you don't have Christ? Your good works? Morality? The Bible says our righteousness, what we think is righteous to God, is filthy rags. Your rags aren't going to set you free. You're going to bring that, here's death, here's my my rags, it's not going to work. You can't win against death and Satan's power of death. Only Christ can, and he proved it through his death and his resurrection. 
So as believers, our hope lies not in our goodness, because we have none of it, but in the righteousness of Christ and his power to conquer death. And as, as a result, death for the Christian is no longer an enemy, it's a reconciled friend. Right? Death is our entrance into the actual and eternal presence of God, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And so we do not fear that. Right? We welcome that. doesn't mean we just want to die. I want to die tomorrow. But when that time comes, we're ready to go and be with the Lord. So freedom from that fear of death is a tremendous burden that is removed from us upon faith in Christ. And that has very real practical blessings for us here in this life And there's even more blessings for here and now. Let's look at verses 16 to 18. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. So another great blessing of salvation is that Christ helps us here. He doesn't help the angels. He helps the offspring of Abraham. Who are the offspring of Abraham? Those are Christians. This is not willy-nilly loose language. Like, oh, he just helps, Jesus helps everybody. No, he helps the children of Abraham. He's not talking about physical ancestry to Abraham. All believers, all Christians are called the sons and daughters of Abraham. Paul said, if you are Christ, then you are what? You are Abraham's offspring. And so if you're his offspring, he's going to be your helper. And because of that, he had to become like us in every way. And that makes him a merciful and faithful high priest who makes propitiation for the sins of the people. You probably haven't used that word this week, propitiation, right? You may never use that word. I don't think that word is used ever outside of the Bible. Um, It just means an atoning sacrifice. So the high priest in the Old Testament would have to perform a sacrifice to be the propitiation for the sins of the people. Christ became that final high priest through the sacrifice of himself. He gave himself as a propitiation for our sin. That's the only way any of these blessings can be made to us. That's the only way that you can become one of Abraham's offspring. And obviously, he had to become a man who was capable of dying in order for that to take place. And as he lived on this earth for those, give or take, 33 years... He suffered, and he suffered in far greater ways than we can ever imagine. It says he himself suffered when tempted. And that word can be translated as tested, tried. So it's not as though Jesus went through temptations and and testing without any struggle at all, because he was God, that he got a free pass out of those things. He didn't. Yes, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And because he was a man, he suffered and endured temptation. Uh, The most uh, kind of obvious example would be when he was in the wilderness for those 40 days being tempted. That was a time of great suffering, not just because he wasn't eating, but because of the attacks of of Satan. He was tempted by Peter not to go to the cross, right? He went through every type of temptation, but he came out victorious, but only through suffering. And because of that, he's able to help us. He's able to identify with us. He guides us. He comforts us. His word instructs us. If you're going to be successful, if you're going to become good at anything in life, typically you need to learn from someone, right, who is better than you at the thing. So if you want to learn an instrument, right, you need to learn from someone who's at least a little bit better than you so they can teach you. If you want to be good at basketball, right, you need to learn from a coach, perhaps, or another player that's better than you. You know, the examples go on and on. If you want to learn how to get through all the suffering and trials and temptations of life, you need to learn from the man who suffered through it all and overcame it perfectly, right? So you learn from Christ. You are helped by, by him. 
So there's one of the, one of the things I want to stress to people who may not call themselves Christians or aren't really a Christian is is that any any goodness you see in the life of a Christian is not because we're so disciplined and moral. It's that we have Christ as our helper. And we're not perfect by any means. Nobody is. But sometimes if you live a life different than the rest of the world, you're pursuing holiness, and people think, whoa, that guy's a real like disciplined like holy roller or something. And you look at Christianity and you're like, I can never do that. That seems like no fun. There's all these rules. Uh, you, you, I can't follow them. And, and that's not what it's about at all. Of course, there's commands to follow. But we don't follow them simply because, well, that's just what you're supposed to do. It's the right thing to do. We follow them because we want to follow them. We want to please God. And we follow them not in our own strength. We can't. We follow the commands of God because Christ helps us and the Holy Spirit helps us. And there is a struggle and there is suffering to fight against temptation. The Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, so the Apostle Paul, who is a man we would all Christians would strive to be like, says, I just live by faith in the Son of God. It's not actually him. So Jesus, yeah, he could not sin. Right? It was impossible. But he could be tempted. And he would not be tempted without suffering. So you can sin, you yourselves and myself, we can sin, right? We're different, and we do sin, and we can be tempted. And to overcome temptation involves suffering as a Christian. It involves refraining from doing what your flesh wants to do, and that causes suffering. And you may feel like you know, the suffering you go through, no one understands, which may be true except that Jesus understands because he actually went through it and suffered just like, the, like us in every way. And so what Christ gives us by his grace is real practical help here in this life as believers. So through his incarnation, he became a man. And because he was fully God, yet at the same time fully man, he suffered when tempted just like us. And his greatest act of suffering was, of course, Calvary, where the wrath of his father was poured out upon him. And that was the means by which we are set free from the fear of death, which enslaves each and every one of us by nature. We're held captive by Satan in lifelong slavery to the fear of death. That's what the scripture says. And Jesus sets us free by destroying, disarming the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil. And so what do we do with that information the first thing is believe it. If you're not a Christian, believe it today. Come to Christ today. Break free of your slavery to the fear of death today through faith in Christ. Repent and believe the gospel today. Why would you put off the blessings of salvation for one more second? You're not guaranteed a deathbed. And even if you plan to do that last minute, your heart might be already too hard. And you're missing out on all the blessings that Christ offers you in this life. Those shackles of fear and death can be broken right now by the power of Christ. And if you are a Christian, remind yourself of these truths. Rejoice in these truths. This should cause us to really celebrate the incarnation of Christ like never before, not just on Christmas, but every single day, remembering why Jesus came to, fear, to free us from that fear of death. So when you reflect upon your deliverance from the fear of death, and that's something I think we could just kind of forget about as Christians. We just forget, like, we have this tremendous fear of death and we don't have that anymore. That should bring with it, when we think about that, this an overwhelming sense of contentment and peace. How can we complain when we've been set free, delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the light of Christ? How can we complain about suffering when we read about how Jesus suffered when tempted and he was tempted in every way yet without sin. I think the overall theme here really is hope. There is hope in Christ, and that's what everyone needs, right? 
we have hope because he defeated death and Satan, the thing that has been nagging mankind since, since the fall. We have hope as we suffer as Christians because Christ suffered in every way and much worse than, than we. So the message of Christmas, whether, it's, whether you realize it or not, what it should be, the message of the incarnation is a message of hope, that death has come into the world through sin. That's bad, bad news, but Christ defeated that death on the cross, delivering us from the enslavement we had to that fear of death, and he helps us, his children, as we suffer when we are tempted. So yes, salvation in Christ, of course, gives us eternal blessings, the, the blessings of heaven and the presence of God forever when we die, after we die. But there are so many blessings, really too many to even name, that he gives us here in this life as well. Come thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we leave this place and perhaps go to exchange gifts in the next couple of days, Lord, may we never forget the greatest gift that we have, and that is Christ and the deliverance from sin and death, deliverance from the bondage of this uh, fear of death. We thank you that you came and humbled yourself and took on flesh and died in the place of sinners and rose again. I pray that that would be a reality for all who are gathered here. By your grace, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.